So hi, everyone, and welcome to the MLOps podcast. I'm your host, Dean, and today I have with me Hamil Hussein. Hamil is probably most well known, at least to me, as uh, one of the faces of Fast AI, a framework that makes uh, neural networks uncool again, as, as they say it, but also makes them very, very accessible and provides an educational foundation for uh, people to get into the world of uh, machine and deep learning. He was a data scientist at Data Robot. Airbnb, a staff ML engineer at GitHub, and he headed the machine learning and data science at Outer Bounds. Uh, or in other words, he's been working on machine learning problems and thinking about MLOps long before the term uh, even existed. And he's generally a uh, great, very humble, and uh, very open person. And uh, since I'm a longtime fan, I'm really excited to have you on. Thank you for taking the time. Yeah, thanks a lot, Dean. Glad to so, be here. Yeah, it's it's my pleasure. Um, diving right into it, uh, starting with uh, with a hardball question: Are large language models still interesting or overhyped? They're very interesting. Yeah, I think that. So okay, when large language models kind of came onto the scene, uh, sort of with ChatGPT, I think it's fair to say that's when it really came onto the scene in the public eye there was an explosion of developers from every walk of life kind of jumping into the the ring building that you would open social media or anything in any given day and you would just see a influx of like oh i reimagined this thing with with language models and I'm launching this product with language models. And it was almost to the extent, or it is actually still this way. It's like anytime, even if you have any idea, all you had to do is open social media and someone would have already launched that idea within uh, like, you know, within days. And I've never seen anything like that before. Um, I think with machine learning prior to language models, People sort of just talked about it a lot, about machine learning, how it's cool and everything. But this time, it's like everyone just dropped what they're doing, seemingly, and just jumped into, oh, we have to use these language models right now. Let's just, uh, you know, we have to integrate it into products or create products with language models. Everyone seemed like they were doing it. It was, it was quite overwhelming for being a developer. Like, I think like some of the magic of being a developer is to try to find the white space somewhere, like try to find something where there aren't too many people working on a thing where you kind of like identify a need. I think that's like the, I think every developer wants to find that, you know, to find something where they can kind of carve out a corner, a quiet corner to work on that they find interesting. But I don't think, I think like in a way it, it was pretty hard to find that in a sense with large language models there was no quiet corner mm -hmm. it was uh basically yeah it was like seemed like all of tech has descended upon that and so in that way it felt there was some feeling of being overhyped but not in the not i don't think overhyped is the wrong word there was some negative feelings among some folks that wow okay this is a lot of noise doesn't, you know, people may have not felt like it was even productive to pay attention to the discourse around it, as develop, especially as developers. And then also, also there is this feeling of like some existential, um, like angst. More professionally, like where do I fit in in all this? You know, mm -hmm. because everything's moving so fast, so on and so forth. And so for some time, I felt also overwhelmed. I thought, where do I fit in, in this language model stuff? It seemed like, at first, it seemed like, oh, wow, okay, like, the people that seem like they're, that, you know, that are best positioned to kind of take advantage of language models are people that are not machine learning people at all. There's, like, application developers, front-end developers, things like that. Those are the people that can sort of create interesting applications and deploy them the fastest mm -hmm. with these LLMs. 
and I thought, wow, okay, like that that happened quickly. Like I don't think I was like, oh wow, okay, this is one area of machine learning where I guess I'm not needed. I think it was a little bit hard to admit to myself. I mean, I think that's what I thought at first. I'm, I don't believe that anymore, but it did it did feel that way. Mm-hmm. And, and I thought, wow, okay, that's really interesting. Um, you know, maybe that is the case. And I sort of got, yeah, I didn't know what to think. It was all happening so fast. And I was sort of like processing all of these things. Sure. And I think a lot of people sort of reacted in different ways. Some people just kind of jumped in, uh, sort of using, you know, language models. Some people just kind of stepped away and said like, hey, this is too much. This is too much energy. And it kind of articulated that in different ways. Like some people said, oh, this is overhyped or, you know, this is too much noise or I don't, you know, it's certain things like that. So... Eventually, like, it was interesting because I, you know, I was doing, I'm doing some consulting right now Mm -hmm. to help uh, steer me and, like, kind of uh, guide my sort of next entrepreneurial uh, explorations on, like, what to build next. And I was working with this one client, um, Honeycomb which was trying to develop a natural language query interface on top of their observability system. So you're using an LLM to basically construct queries, not SQL queries, but more like it's like a special query language that they have, sure. um, you know, for it's like you, yeah, it's a special query language. And they were, they were like, we need your help. And at first I was like, Oh, you need my help. Like why, why would you need my help? Like, it looks like you guys can just do it. Like, I mean, um, you know, I was just kind of caught up in that thinking of like, oh, okay, maybe I'm not needed in this situation. Because it seemed like I had this mental model, like, okay, like people are smart, they can figure it out. Um, you know, they can use these models off the shelf and like no modeling is needed. You know, perhaps sort of it'll be fine. And they're like, no, no, like we, I think we might need your help somehow. I, I, they're like, we don't know why we don't, we're not hundred percent sure, but we, we just want to consult with you and like discuss what we're doing. It's interesting. And so that was really interesting. Cause like, then I realized, wow, they really do need someone with the type of training in the thinking that machine learning people have. So, uh, with Honeycomb, you know, they launched this kind of alpha version of the product. They kind of took, uh, you know, they glued it, they glued this thing into their front end and sort of uh, made like a minimal viable product that can do this natural language to query uh, a sort of uh, thing, you know, make this thing happen. Sure. And, um, you know, there was a lot of open questions, like how do we evaluate this model? Yes. And then also, how do we even how do we go about making this thing work better? Which is tied into how do we evaluate this model? And uh, I thought that was really interesting. So, we have, for example, um, you know, so the, it was actually, it's a really good use case. Like Honeycomb, since they are an instrumentation company, they are an observability platform. They did a lot of instrumentation on this particular feature. Sure. And so the question became like, okay, how do we measure this? Should we just do A-B tests? For example, like one question came up like, hey, can we just do A-B tests forever and just do prompt engineering and kind of do mm-hmm. things that way? And I, I said, no, you can't do that. That will take too long. Like every time you iterate, you have to do a full A-B test and sure. kind of wait for statistical significance and like design your experiments carefully. That might not be the best way to go. Uh, you know, let's try to construct an offline data set that makes sense. Let's uh, let's define some metrics here that are proxy metrics that we have confidence in that sort of align with how we think this model or the answers that should uh, be given to users. And let's think like really carefully about the domain. Like, okay, we're going from we're going from like natural language to query 
it's kind of like code generation more you know it's a little more yeah. of a constrained problem more like copilot which is something i worked on sure um so that has a number of advantages you can test you can test that generated code in a variety of ways you can introspect that code uh you can have some notion of correctness that you that you might not be able to with more ended open open ended questions and things like that and and so yeah and so we were able to like iterate on that together and like really use that thinking that I've taken for granted of how to evaluate models mm-hmm. like how to evaluate models you can argue is the heart of machine learning cuz that's the most important the most important part of any machine learning endeavor is like is a uh, loss fund designing de- designing evaluation mm-hmm. uh the evaluation system carefully and and making sure that you get that right otherwise it's like you can't iterate on it you can't make any progress and it doesn't make any sense because you you mean ultimately you have to make sure your model generalizes mm-hmm. uh and you know the way to do that most effectively is to and then the first in sort of the first line of defense is like really good uh evaluation system and so and so yeah i kind of it was so ingrained in my mind i like took it for granted like oh like evaluation system that's not cool that seems like everyone knows how to do that but that's not really the case um you know i think this kind of thinking is really uh yeah it's really drilled into you as a machine learning data science person of like how to do this how to think about this and then it's also all of these like nuanced skills of okay like where am i going to get this data from um you know like how can i construct this evaluation data set while respecting customer privacy um how can i is there any other data sets available in this company that can help me here is there any kind of other uh sort of clever things I can do. And these are the things that you do in any machine learning project, almost every machine learning project in the wild. I mean, you don't necessarily see these kind of challenges sort of in toy problems, but like you have yeah. to reach for sort of these things a lot when you're when you are yeah, like doing applied ML problems. And so like just to kind of break it down a little bit more when we got to helping Honeycomb with with this specific problem, you know, one really useful tool is error analysis. So looking at, you know, all of the different types of errors, like some types of errors, are like customers flagging, okay, this this answer wasn't helpful, this query wasn't helpful, or other errors where it, uh, the model returned invalid code, or other errors where uh, it was clear that people are trying to do prompt injection and be very silly, like. <laughs> you know, give me a recipe for making pizza or something in this natural language query. And there's all kinds of stuff going on and kind of categorizing that and doing error analysis and seeing, like, well, okay, what are the different kinds of errors and like, what can we do about that? And then from there, you kind of understand, okay, this is how you might be able to build an evaluation system. You can ask a lot of questions like, okay, this is a expected query. Um, how many, what, what are the degrees of freedom on the different kinds of queries that are quote right answers and is there anything in common between these right answers like for example we know that okay there should be certain column names present in in all cases uh in these like right answers have to have at least these column names and you know we kind of drilled into like all of these things and are able to come up with and are still designing like these proxy metrics that will guide us will able to allow us to iterate much faster and kind of uh, move very quickly. And this is the same thing that happened in Copilot. So Copilot, you know, when Copilot was first being worked on, so first of all, I just want to mention, okay, I like, I'm going to stop for a second because I've been ranting on for a while. Let me, let's say, do you have any questions? Anything it's, so it's super, it's super interesting. Uh, I think there, there's a lot to uh, unpack in what you said, which, which I think is, um, it's sort of this is a useful way to think about things because I because of the first thing that you talked about, which is I think it's really hard to 
uh, separate what's going on because of the hype and bringing this down into practical problems that are maybe uh, more familiar uh, to us makes that um, uh, sort of a more of an engineering task, which I think it still is. Like, I, I don't think we are in the realm of uh, AGI and fully autonomous agents where no one needs to even look at what they're doing and things like that. That's not where we are. There's still a lot of engineering problems in actually making this work for real products, uh, real products in the real world. Um, I, I think that one sort of um, uh, distinction I, I want to make in case someone is, th that I think is important, right? That the, the use case that you're describing is, is sort of a co-pilot use case, right? Like a uh, user is going to ask the model to perform a task and then uh, review the result of that model. Um, and then that's that's going to then sort of be fed into the system and, and hopefully get them a result. So it's supposed to save them time, but it's not like asking a question and then having the model go ahead and do something without anyone reviewing what it's what it's doing or, or, or something like that. And and one of the things I'm also I'm interested in to hear if you have an opinion on is what happens in those cases uh, because in theory you could use them right. Like the uh, I've been speaking with people who are working on uh, proper chatbots where the idea is. To have the chatbot replace uh, financial consultant, a doctor, whatever, uh, and there you don't have oversight. Like you're training the model, you're putting it into the wild. Uh, there's this uh, stupid example of you know a sales chatbot, and then it offers all the customers the product for free. Um, but you could find more uh, life-threatening examples or or uh, or things like that. And and to me, most of the evaluations that we've seen are sort of comparing one model to another, right? Like those that are in public, like. Is GPT-4 better than Claude or uh, what's the difference between the open source models and not open source models? Uh, but in the end, what you're talking about, which is sort of a uh, evaluation that's associated with a specific task and not a comparative evaluation, that's the thing that's going to define whether or not these models go into actual products. Um, and so A, I'm curious to hear if you have thoughts on doing these evaluations for cases where in the end, the deployment is going to be like, no one is reviewing the output and uh, um, like, how does that look in those cases? And then specifically, how did you, um, how did you decide what a good threshold for deploying this in like the example that you gave, what was a good threshold to deploy this uh, in the sense that a model might be uh, really, really good, but then have some catastrophic failure vector that you only re realize later. So if you have any thoughts on mitigating that. Yeah. I mean, it's hard for me to like offer like a generalized playbook at this point, um, you know, because it's still pretty early. But what I can say is, you know, you have to think really carefully, at, at least at this point, it's helpful to think very carefully about the specific problem and sort of the, yeah, like the temperament of the company you're working for or working with. In this case, you know, they had already shipped some initial version. And so any incre you know, incremental improvements here on out are, are welcome. And yeah. some principled approach to achieving that are welcome. Mm -hmm. um, so there was not, there's not necessarily, in this case, there's not necessarily a threshold or anything like that. It's just, hey, like you want more visibility into, and you want like a an approach to how to think about how you might iterate and say, because like, it's a process. Like you have all these, you know, you have a certain class of errors, but of course, as you iterate on this product and it gets better, you will uncover like completely new types of errors that sure. you didn't have observability into before. As people trust your, this product, they will be more ambitious in how they use it. Um, and so um, it's a constant process of like, you know, having these things sort of, uh, you know, like a human in the loop. I'm not too sure about like complete, you know, this auto GPT, like in a situation where there's no human in the loop at all. I think that's problematic because uh, it's really hard to evaluate things in some, yeah, it's definitely hard, maybe impossible to evaluate language models without human in the loop. Uh, and, in some sense, because, you know, the goal of one of the main goals of 
this technology is to align align the models with human preferences. Sure. And so, you know, if you can't do that, if you don't have any human in the loop, then by definition, you can't do that. And so, and you might want to, I suspect that you will want to align them with human preferences in very specific situations, maybe differently. Um, because it can be, yeah, it's a little bit, it, there's a lot of gray area. Like, even though you might, you're like, oh, I'll give you the right answer. Um, it might not be helpful or it might be half right or it might be somewhat right. Um, but there might be other answers that might be better. Things like that. I mean, sort of just the general alignment problem. I haven't worked on, I haven't tried to work, you know, work on anything like that. So I don't really know. Mm -hmm. um, all I can say is like, if I were to work on something different that was more open-ended, I would probably still reach for error analysis and mm -hmm. try to come up with proxy metrics and reference metrics that correlate somehow with uh, like the things the the things that people care about. Fair enough. And, and, I, and I think it's possible. I think that you know it might take some creativity, might take some digging around. It's I don't think like you know I can just say okay like these are the metrics you need and just use this Python package and it will just do it for you. I'm not I don't think that is a is a thing so yet <laughs> yet but i'm not sure if it's a thing um but i haven't thought super deeply about it but I, yeah i'm not sure like there is no yeah i mean there is no because if you go back to classic machine learning for example there's not really like tool it's a, a process is just important as tools like sure there's no tool that will solve data quality for you uh, our level like do you know really good anomaly detection always on every case for you you know you still need to sort of have some good processes sure I, I, I guess in, in the like in the case that you did solve for and by the way um, I didn't know that you worked with Honeycomb but they uh, published a really really good blog that I read uh, I think it was yesterday or the day before uh, about sort of the problems or challenges with uh, using LLMs in production. I'll add the link in the description, but I think uh, if, if uh, the audience is interested, which I'm guessing they are, they should read it. It's uh, well it's well written and sort of uh, articulates well a lot of the, the challenges around this. But I guess if you can share, uh, if this is not like secret, if you can share a bit more about the process of building these metrics, like did you just end up, you know, building a test set and the challenge was just deciding what tests uh, sort of what test examples should be in it or was there like a, something more unique because this is a generative model or or something like that i don't mm. know yeah we're still building the test set actually like you know building the test set is non-trivial it's like okay what customers do we build the test set from what mm. uh everyone you know what schemas what what is uh what do people's schemas look like you know, there is a common set of schemas that kind of are associated with this thing called open telemetry, which is this common standard mm -hmm. of uh, logging observability information. So it, it, it's kind of, you know, all these considerations, like do we, do we use open telemetry and kind of bootstrap from there and like solve that? And then once we do have this test data, it's important to be able to execute these queries that the system mm -hmm. is generating. Or be able to go back and debug the queries. Say, hey, this is the query that was that was generated. The customer either you know marked it as thumbs up or thumbs down. We want to be able to programmatically generate or uh, execute those things. Where do we execute yeah. that? Do, can we execute it on the instance on the customer's instance? You know, maybe not. That might not be good. Um, you know, what from are security the security perspective or for, for in from a resource perspective, security perspective? You don't want to interfere with what they're doing necessarily. Um, you know, how do we think about that from a product perspective? Like, is it okay to prospectively generate queries? Maybe we need to, you know, so like there's this ongoing design problem. Like, do you have a proxy data set that you source from somewhere else that is like similar enough? How different is that? Is that representative? 
um, all these traditional kind of mundane data science problems that you get into with like basically where do you get the data? Is this data good data? Can you use this? Is this good enough? Um, you know, how are you going to build sort of some tools around this and build like an evaluation system? Mm -hmm. um, there's so many things that kind of come into play um, that, you know, they're not necessarily glamorous, but it does, yeah, it's all very familiar, I would say. Um, I, I think that the outlier is what we had in the recent years up to now, which I, I think like if you go back enough, uh, data science was science around data. And there was this uh, interim period where it became science around models. And now because the models are being built externally, it goes back to data, right? Like, like all the problems that you said are basically around making really getting really good data, right? Like, where does this data come from? How do I understand that what I'm pushing to this model, which in, in this case is no longer for training it, but just for evaluating it, um, is is what I want uh, to, to get to the model? Um, how do I iteratively improve that and things like that? That makes um, that makes a lot of sense. I feel like in a sense, again, if you if you abstract away what this data is going into, right? The maybe this work is closer to what happened to, to what would be sort of the case, I don't know, before 2012 uh, or, or something like that. Yeah. Um, and you have some, yeah, it's, it's important to also have the end in mind. Like you have some ideas that you want to try. You have like some hypotheses, like for example, um, you know, Honeycomb didn't really, wasn't at that time, wasn't really aware of things like chain of thought. Mm -hmm. There's there's even tree of thought. Or yeah. there's other, like these prompting techniques. Um, you know, si there's also techniques. So there's also this feeling of, okay, you know, using off-the-shelf models like GPT-4, but if you if you look at it closely, it's a you know it's generating code, and it's not it's it's constrained it's a constrained enough problem where it's generating code for a, basically like a low resource language that probably GPT four hasn't seen any of or not much of this honeycomb query language, mm -hmm. and um, you know, my feeling is that okay perhaps train you know fine tuning an open source language model against lots of examples of that might work um, because right now what they're doing is they're shoving the entire query spec into the system prompt mm -hmm. to try to give the every call to language model contains the entire context of and try to uh, entire specification of the query language and you know it's kind of like copilot like you don't wouldn't want to do that for a language you know, you want to mm -hmm. train, you You know, this, you would it's like a new programming language. You want to kind of let the model see a lot of examples of that programming language. And so where do you get that from? So like, you know, just like a data scientist would do, you have to kind of understand everything about their business and their product and try to be creative in like where you can source this data. So like, for example, um, in this case, you know, customers save queries uh, they call it named mm -hmm. queries. You can just save qu your favorite queries and you kind of write a name or a description. And so like that's a really interesting set of data where you can sort of turn those into question query mm -hmm. pairs. You can have a language model turn that name or that description into a question. And you can, you know, that's one thing that I really want to try. Um, and you can sort of not only have just one question, you can have like many variations of that question Hopefully that mean the same thing, and then you can have examples of the query. Um, you can also try to see like what are the most popular queries, especially in the cases where the schema is is uh, this like standard schema, this open telemetry sch schema. Like if you, what's the Pareto of those queries? Like are they like just really popular queries that are uh, sort of the same? And then can you once you know can you build question and answer pairs from that you can use like a you know a language model to do that and then like sure. use that for a data set and then somehow either you and then you know also um you know some of these queries you know they have a very specific syntax so 
there's all these like interesting techniques that are kind of out there. Um, one is like, okay, you can put a sort of something on top of the DD uh, decoder that kind of clamps mm -hmm. the model to make sure that uh, it follows a specific syntax. Like, you know, like it's valid. J you can force it, force valid JSON. You don't have to like wait till the end. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it'll guide the model. It'll say, okay, this next token has to be a comma. We're just going to make it happen, you know, instead of like waiting and sort of re rehashing that. So there's a lot of opportunities perhaps for open source models. And I'm a, I don't know if it'll work, but the idea is like you, ha you, you know, it's kind of the same thing as being a data scientist. You have these other hypotheses, things you want to try, things you think might work. And you want to keep all of that in mind for when you design this evaluation system or when you think about evaluation system, because you want to be, you have, want to be able to enable all of that in addition to like, you know, prompt engineering and things like that. And so it all comes into play a bit. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's, um, it's really interesting. I mean, I was, yeah, again, I was surprised. I took it for granted that this way of thinking or this knowledge was valuable or even unique. I'm sure it's not hundred percent unique. I'm sure like there are engineers out there that, you know, kind of have a good intuition for how to do this or maybe, sure. but it is definitely, uh, something that I think machine learning people come trained out of the box for. And then, you know, also, yeah, I, I do tend to try and keep up with a lot of the research or more the applied stuff rather on like how to use language models effectively because mm -hmm. I'm just interested in that. And, you know, all of those things that you might, uh, you know, because, yeah, if you're a machine learning person, you might have done that in a correlated way with like, models you know architectures things like that so it is interesting um yeah i think that there's a lot of space for machine learning people and then more generally speaking beyond the stuff that i just said i do think that open source models are going to be going to be extremely valuable and we'll start to approach uh, the capabilities of these proprietary models and you know then that's back into classic machine learning, machine learning ops land, like you're going to fine tune, we're going to source the data, fine tune models. You're going to have to, again, like measure the efficacy of these models in various ways. Um, mm -hmm. And then you're going to have to serve models, instrument them, so on and so forth. Same, similar to what you would do with like classic ML. You can have the same challenge, you know, some some new challenges, but very, very similar challenges. And then you, you may need like a lot of the same skill set. Yeah, I, I think that the some of the things that you uh, mentioned, like uh, chain of thoughts and uh, and tree of thoughts and all of them, I think, uh, I'm not sure actually if React is one of them, but there's a lot of the sort of, um, I don't know how to call it, uh, specialized tools for uh, LLM uh, manipulation, which if, if I sort of take a step back and look at and, and look at this uh, uh, from, from afar and maybe squint a bit, it seems like it, that's more... Of an engineering task, like it's adding a bunch of glue code. Uh, glue. I, I'm saying that. I hope that doesn't sound to anyone like a derogatory term. I'm a. I'm a glue code fan. Um, so you you add a bunch of glue code around this thing, and that enables it to do, like, it, it gives it superpowers that it didn't have before. So I, I think from the conversation so far, it's clear that you are of the opinion that data scientists and ML engineers still have a role to play. It's not going to be a dying uh, uh, job title. I guess m my other question is, do you think that that's going to um, look more and more like m more classical engineering or uh, is that still going to be a very different discipline? Um, and I don't know, like devs vs. Uh, data scientists is still going to be a big thing. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, okay. So, I mean, I don't know that. I mean, of course, like language models is only a subset of machine learning. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, yeah, I don't think the field is going to become be eviscerated completely or anything like that. So some people do think uh, that, so I think it's, yeah, it's some worth stating. That, yeah. I, <laughs> I don't. I mean, it will change. I don't think sure. that it's going to. Yeah, it might change. It might change significantly. Um, but I think there is. Okay, so another way. 
to ask a question is, if you are, okay, so there's kind of two lenses. One is if you are a data scientist today with significant experience in the field, does, do, does all your, do all your skills, are all your skills completely obsolete? And the answer is no. I think we addressed that just now mm -hmm. talking about all this stuff about, you know, intuition about sourcing data, cleaning data, evaluation, things like that. Like all those skills still matter. Mm -hmm. um, and arguably you are really good at that. Uh, better than anyone else of thinking through that rigorously. There's a lot of others. I mean, yeah. So that is useful. Um, I'm not saying everything, you know, may not be useful, um, as useful. I mean, you know, the way you write code might change. You know, I, I would argue you don't want to completely ignore things like GitHub Copilot and just pretend like they don't exist. Like, if you're not using them in your coding workflow and thoughtfully, I'm not saying use it blindly, but if you're, it, it does strike me like if you just, if you don't incorporate it into your workflow somehow, then you're going to be at a big disadvantage. So I think it's like, sure. yeah, just um, sort of, I think it, things will change, but I don't think it changes so dramatically that it just pulls the rug out from underneath you. Mm -hmm. Um you know, I think it's it's fairly reasonable to be able to adapt to these changes. I mean, like I said, I'm yeah, like I was surprised myself that okay, like it feels like I, um, my skills are actually still pretty useful. Uh, so, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think it's good. I mean, and so I shared that because I think a lot of people in ML has some existential crisis. Like, okay, what do I do now? Like, should I even be doing this stuff? Uh, what do I learn? And, you know, the answer is, like, try to just try to get into one of these projects. Um, you know, you don't you don't have to. But I think if you do try to be involved with projects like these, you'll quickly see that, yeah, there's a lot of value that you can add. And that will kind of mitigate your ex existential crisis. Uh, that's... um. Uh, I think there's an entrepreneurial term for that, which is uh, running towards danger. So if you if you feel like that ChatGPT is is going to replace you, try doing a serious project with ChatGPT and seeing uh, see what what you get out of that and and where the obstacles are. Uh, that seems like a healthy healthy approach uh, and and reduces existential uh, uh, dread, which is good. Um, I, I guess like uh, from one sort of thing that I find interesting in, in this entire story is is the way you were thinking about this before versus after you were approached to sort of uh, help out with uh, the honeycomb problem. Um, I, generally, I, I feel like, I guess, in, in your, like me following you and, and the, the content that you create, I think you have a relatively, un relatively unique way to think about uh, machine learning, ML ops, um, and, and solving these problems. I, I'm curious, like, um, if you can maybe share your process a bit for doing that, if there's someone in the audience who sort of wants to learn and feels the same way that, that I do, like, how do you go about solving MLOps problems? How do you go about solving these, uh, or thinking about these problems? Yeah. I mean, I don't think there's that much secret sauce. I think just generally speaking, I try to keep it simple. Um, you know, I, yeah, I try to, I think that's like an important principle is, okay, in classic machine learning, I even say, don't do machine learning first. Like try to do solve the problem without machine learning. Uh, that's your first, uh, like iterate, that should be your first point of iteration. Like, and that's what I mean by trying to keep it simple. And same thing here um, is, okay, yeah, like try to do the simplest thing you can sort of to be effective. Um, yeah, I mean, that's one principle, um, I guess like, I'm not sure exactly what you might find unique about what I do. Um, I guess I also try to seek some contrarian approaches to doing things and just kind of explore them. So a lot of my ex sort of involvement with fast AI was sort of these contrarian approaches to doing things. 
Um, and, you know, I've kind of sort of changed my mind in a lot of ways. Um, I went from, oh, okay, this contrarian approach is the best way to more recently, I don't know about that contrarian approach. I don't think it, I think it may not be that good. Um, and I think like, yeah, trying to expose yourself to different ways of doing things is important. Um, it gives you perspective on sort of what what is useful and what's not useful. Um, yeah, and yeah. try to put your, I think like uh, working in public is helpful because it mm -hmm. allows you to meet people and sort of increases the chances of that you will collide with something that you're interested in. Mm -hmm. um, those are some things I can think of. I don't know if that answers the question, but. No, that's, those are all, all good. And also a good segue into something that is sort of a step back that I, I wanted to ask, but I'll, I'll just uh, note that I think uh, working in public or in general being like working in public is a, a sort of a methodical forced way to uh, get feedback from external sources uh, and put yourself out there, which I think is, is sort of the uh, underlying important thing. Um, it, it means that you have to formulate your thoughts and opinions in a way that they can be accessible to other people. Otherwise, it's just going to um, sort of not promote useful conversation. And I think this is part of, of what I like about the, the things that you you write and you share on social media and things like that. So so these are all uh, great tips. I, I think like, at least for me, I'm, I'm curious to, to hear this. And I don't think we discussed this in the past, uh, but like, uh, I'd love to hear, uh, uh, maybe this was, this should have been the first question I asked, but, uh, if you can share how you got into fast AI and, uh, generally like what was your path in machine learning up to now? Yeah. So yeah, how I got into fast AI, um, yeah, it was kind of in a very uncool way. So basically I was working at GitHub and GitHub came out with GitHub actions which is like a CI, CD tool. You know, up until that point, I was like, didn't really understand CI, CD tools that much. I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. Something automated is happening when I like open a PR, they do these tests. Didn't really like ever look into it or understand details. But I was like, oh, okay, I work at this company. Yeah, I should check it out because it seems like it could be useful for a lot of things. We like automate stuff on repos. I should, that sounds like could all use that every day. So like really dug into it. I was like, oh, this is cool. Um, you know, I really think I could automate a lot of stuff that I wasn't aware of. And so I just started helping Jeremy like with all his CI CD because he didn't have any or he had like barely anything. He had like the bare bones. Okay. Like just whatever. And so I was like, okay, I just started to do all this DevOps stuff. Like all these tests set up like more robust test everywhere across all the repos. Um, like, you know, built, it's like the Docker containers for all these different projects that people could use. And then I try to like, then I actually took it to the extreme. I try to build a static site generator based on GitHub Actions. I did build a static site generator based on GitHub Actions. It's basically like you save a Jupyter notebook into a folder in a repo and it like creates a site. It's a, it's a blog post, like just from the, and that was called fast pages that was like sure. with github actions like automating the whole thing and it was kind of crazy like it was like you you fork that repo and then it automatically opens a pull request on it to set it up for you and then there's like an upgrade path where you open an issue on your own repo and then we would make a pull request from the base the base repo upgrading to the newer version of fast pages all these like crazy actions nice. went kind of overboard anyways that was cool. And then, uh, yeah, and then, like, you know, I started to, to like, look into NB Dev because, like, because when you set up tests and do all this DevOps, you got to understand, like, how all the software works because you have to test it. You're like, why is this test breaking? Like, how do you set it up? Like, what is it? So, I was like, what is this NB Dev? So, it's kind of crazy. It's like, oh, cool, you can uh, do notebooks. And then there's another project called FastCore, which is basically a Python language extension. So this is a very deep rabbit hole, getting into all these different things. It's like, oh, okay, I'm just trying to see, you know, CI, but then end up like exploring this sort of 
Python language extension, and then this new software development framework that Jeremy is using, extremely idiosyncratic. And sort of I went in this deep rabbit hole and started like getting into that and contributing to that. And then, yeah, then uh, sort of got sucked into that in a way, in a good way. And yeah, I became really fascinated by it. And I was like, wow, this person is using basically their own, their extensive uh, tool chain that is extremely idiosyncratic. And I thought it was like fascinating because I like to think about, I like really fascinated by people and like what makes them like things that might help them make uh, or help them be effective. And I thought, wow, that's super interesting. Like I'm going to study that for a little bit. That's awesome. I I guess, um, I, I don't know if uh, earlier when you said uh, contrary, having contrarian views for the sake of having them and then figuring out whether or not they make sense. Uh, I, I'm curious if this was one of or the main thing that you were thinking about, but like obviously, uh, or at least to me, fast AI and and uh, Jupyter notebooks are are almost synonymous, so even though it's not it's not the same uh, creators or anything, but they're, it's very very tied. I, I'm curious if if uh, notebooks uh, and and their sort of applicability or where they are applicable uh, is one of the contrarian or is, is something that you would define as a contrarian view that you hold or held or something like that uh or if it's not that i'm curious which contrarian views you used to hold and and now don't anymore yeah like, let's talk about the last part so like you know there was a lot of cool things i mean there was this python language extension and after you learned it it was really cool like you could write code a lot faster fewer lines or lines of code mb dev was obviously you know really cool um you know you could quickly create python packages and you know, document them and test them, have them look really professional in a short amount of time. But it came at a cost, in the sense like an immense cost, which is you if you wanted to engage with any of these projects, you had to climb many mountains. Mm -hmm. You know, you had to understand like what is this. Python language extension, you had to understand like what is this notebook driven software development workflow. And like that also extends to even fast AI itself. Like if you look at the fast AI code, there's a lot of abstractions that mm -hmm. go very deep. You might have to, I mean, you definitely have to get out your code navigation tools and step through many different levels of abstraction to understand what is happening. And I would say, yeah, that comes at a cost. It's very sort of, uh, you know, it's, it's not traditional Python. And it is hyper-optimized. In a, in a sense, it's it's uh, hyper-optimized for personal productivity. Mm -hmm. It's not. And so I kind of leaned into that a bit. I was like, oh, this is so cool. I think it might be better. This might be an interesting way. It might be a like a better way. And then eventually I kind of realized like, hey, um, it's not always better to do that. Like you do, it is, there is a value, for, you know, in certain cases of having your code be very readable to having less abstractions, uh, to using, to following a norm where, you know, people are uh, automatically familiar with the way your code is structured in the way that you sort of are doing things mm -hmm. and so yeah um you know that that limited them the number of people that uh, like contributed to the fast ai or open pull request or especially mb dev or anything like that and it was good in the sense like it did filter out like I mean, there was no like there was very few like low quality prs but on the other hand like you know it probably uh, scared lots of people away. And I would say, you know, um, yeah. And so I would say it was all, it was very hyper optimized for individual productivity. But a lot of times you don't want to optimize for that on individual productivity. You might want to optimize for team productivity. And there's different considerations there. I mean, how, you know, I, I wouldn't say, wouldn't try to force tools down anybody's throat. You know, it is a big cell. It is a, you know, a, a big sell to say, 
to any developer, hey, you are going to have to use these set of developer tools if you're going to work on this project. Like, this is the IG you're going to use. This is the workflow you're going to use. Especially if, you know, that's not, that's not going to go well. So there's there's definitely trade-offs. And I guess, um, yeah, I, I became more sort of sensitive to those trade-offs over time. And I would say, yeah, like, I, I'm not sure, like, some of these things... It, it you know are are good in every situation, um, and I realized like, okay, how why they might not be desirable, and there's certain choices like made. Yeah, there's a lot of choices that are made. You know, like for example, every fast diet project, the bleeding edge of is the only stable version, and that's like again to sort of, you know, that's to sort of. Uh, that's around personal productivity in a way. It's not like sure. trying to cater to be an enterprise product or whatever. It's trying to be this like thing that has all this, uh, you know, uh, state of the art stuff, best practices, things like that. And it's hard to do that if you're trying to worry about all these like backward compatibility type stuff. And then furthermore, um, you know, everything is rewritten quite frequently. So fast AI is like mm-hmm. rewritten, MB Dev has been rewritten, so on and so forth, mm-hmm. uh, from scratch even. And so it's just as it's just as much about, you know, it's not it's less about providing software for other people. Uh, you know, and it's uh, there's a lot of exploring programming, exploring mm-hmm. possibilities of programming, abstractions, learning, uh, you know, Jeremy's own learning and exploring just as much as there is like providing software. So I think like there's a lot of things in there. Um, you know, a lot of people have tried to put fast AI in production. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's made for that. It's not necessarily made, it's not made for that as a central concern. And I would say I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. I think you could like maybe learn some things from fast AI, but I don't think that code is optimized for that purpose. I, I like, I would say don't do it. And so um, that's kind of like where the contrarian sort of journey, you know, sort of kind of swam in that pool and then sort of took something away from it. But I didn't sort of uh, become a zealot of in, in every case. And I don't think that was the point either. I would say like that's not, and no one said become a zealot. I'm just saying you could become that way. And I I definitely saw both sides eventually. Sure, I, it's a sort of a strong opinions uh, held uh, loosely, or something like that, right? Uh, yeah, maybe something like that. Yeah, I I think that uh, first I'll I'll share that I think the first PR I had for like a like a ML framework uh, in my life was for Fast AI. I was uh, I was trying to build a, like a depth estimation project. Uh, someone recommended I use Fast AI, and that required like building custom models and custom data loaders and stuff like that. So I had to dive into the nitty gritty and I don't remember what there, there was some issue that I, that I stumbled on and, and I ended up opening like a tiny PR, not anything uh, super meaningful, but, but diving into the code was a bit of a challenge, which I was happy with because it gave me sort of my first opportunity of actually understanding an ML framework code base. Um, but, but I think that the, the way I'm, I think about this today is there's sort of this uh, convenience versus flexibility spectrum. And then there's uh, um, a sort of, are you building something that is aimed at only end users and no one is going to look underneath the hood except for you and maybe a few other people that you know? Or do you expect the average person to need to look under the hood? Um, And then those two sort of uh, one question and one spectrum dictate uh, in many cases like how readable the code should be, uh, what languages or frameworks you should be using, um, how how standard should it be versus like reinventing the wheel and things like that. Um, so I think fast AI like chose a place on that uh, on that spectrum. To me, the the reasoning and this is how I look at this right now. I don't know if you think about this the same way, but the reasoning was that fast AI in many senses was an educational tool. Yeah. And there you you might prioritize convenience over flexibility because you don't need the student to you know, 
break everything apart and do something super custom, uh, they can get a lot from doing, from staying within the guardrails and getting a really convenient experience so that they can focus on, uh, on what's important. Yeah, I think uh, so. Yeah. So, yeah. And uh, so I think yeah. like it tried to, you know, Fasto like was innovating on many fronts, like on machine learning, but also on software engineering, trying to push the boundaries of that. And so it was simultaneously doing all of these things. Yeah. And I think like, it was a little bit of an unstated thing. Like no one said like, hey, don't put this in production or anything like mm -hmm. that. And I think some people, a lot of people definitely got confused trying to. Um, and I, I think that, yeah, it's hard not to, yeah, it's hard not to uh, look behind like it's it's hard to have a tool with a stated goal that you don't need to look into the internals, especially for machine learning. It just doesn't. Sure. It's it's a that's a really tall tall order. There's a guy. There's a so a lot of people came and went through fast AI that have like been through this uh, sort of same journey. I'm not unique. Sylvain mm -hmm. uh, Sylvain Guger he he co-authored the this uh, book with Jeremy. He went on to work at Hugging Face. Um, you know, at Hugging Face, he's not using any of these uh, the stack at all for transformers he's like technical technical lead for the transformers he's not using mb dev mm -hmm. or anything like that and he kind of went the other direction and said hey i want this code to be readable it's okay if you repeat certain things i you know kind of like bucked some of the trend there zach mueller also this other guy he's also working at huggy face went through a similar journey and he's also has a kind of same opinion and he has like a course helping to teach people, okay, like went through, if you went through fast AI, like this is how you can think about uh, how production and you know applied work might be different, how you might want to change your code or use different tools uh, and things like that. Yeah, Zach was the PR reviewer for my contribution mm. a gajillion yeah. years ago. Um, yeah, that's uh, I, I think that a lot of really great people have worked on fast AI, which I think shows uh, like even that just shows something uh, in, in my mind. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a great it's, like, it's, it's a good actually a good sort of... community. It's like a really nice people. And yeah, one of the few places on the Internet where there's low toxicity. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's uh, it, it was unique at the time. I think it 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 sort of. Uh, has a warm place in my heart and and it's uh interesting interesting uh sort of framework uh to use and fun also um i guess like nvdev i know you were working on this uh we talked before we started recording about a post that you did but i'm i'm curious if you if you want to share and talk about like what you're working on uh right now and and why you're working on it yeah i'm still kind of figuring out what i'm working on right now for so I, yeah i mean i decided to pivot away from okay so to give more background um sometime last year i left my job my full-time job at outer bounds to pursue sort of commercializing nb dev and the reason i did that was mainly driven by hey i really like these people jeremy and also wasim who's working with at the time i thought okay great i've been working with at least jeremy for some time in open source i thought okay like it really doesn't matter like um you know if you wanted to build a company around something, then build a company around it. Like, um, mm -hmm. you know, I'm cool with whatever you want to do. Um, I didn't really understand. I didn't really know what we would, how we would try to commercialize MB Dev. I didn't have like the best idea uh, crystallized. But I said, okay, I just mm -hmm. jump into it. Like, it's fine. Um, and the the blog post that you're referencing, which you can probably put in the notes somewhere, just kind of describes like you know, the exploration of that commercialization and then like how I don't think, in, you know, uh, nobody from the three of us had conviction, strong conviction of how to commercialize it. And, you know, sort of we we all kind of went our separate ways. We got, uh, we lost interest. We got nerd sniped, uh, you know, by different things. And eventually we just kind of you know, drifted apart in our interests interests um, because, you know, different people start working on different things. Um, but, you know, it wasn't useless. Like, you know, I started doing consulting as a result of it. And I, first of all, no client that reached out. So we started this consulting practice uh, to kind of 
get design partners and like validate our hypotheses about how to commercialize. We said, you know, like, let's not do things in a vacuum. Let's work with people in industry that are trying to use fast AI stuff. And it was really interesting. Like nobody wanted, yeah, there was no demand for NB dev at all. No one really wanted to like talk about that. People wanted mm -hmm. almost exclusively wanted help like with the ML ops stuff, which almost, which is very interesting because like a lot of that stuff d doesn't, you know, there's not too much of that in fast AI. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, after the LMs sort of came, you know, became popular, then almost exclusively everyone in, uh, wanted help with sort of operationalizing LLMs, kind of like in the example I gave you with Honeycomb. And then I realized like, hey, like this is a really strong signal in one, in, you know, in, in this way, just for the reasons of like, hey, like we sort of are, have different interests as a group. And then also all these people who are reaching out, you know, are interested in this other thing, you know, so kind of sure. think about the customer problems. And then also I have a really strong interest in the, in those things, like in ML ops and building ML tooling, um, you know, prior to fast AI, uh, and like even during fast AI, I worked a lot on ML systems and ML ops stuff. Um, you know, I like all that DevOps stuff. I think it's, yeah. I don't know. I, I want to automate all of these mundane tasks that, you know, are involved with software engineering and, and machine learning. And so I, I said, you know, like this is a clear signal to me that I should pivot and kind of, you know, it's okay. Like the MB dev thing didn't work out from a commercial standpoint, but okay. Like there's this other cool thing that people are asking for. Let me work on that and sort of, yeah, I don't know where that's going to take me. I, I think that there's a good opportunity to build a uh, better infrastructure around large language models. Sure. Um, and I don't think that's, uh, I don't see anything that I like uh, yet. And so that's a strong indicator to me that, okay, I should, uh, yeah, maybe I should build something there. And I've been talking with some folks about that. And I think that sort of thread is exciting to me. I don't have any details yet because it's still very much in, in the ideation sp space, but that's like, yeah, that's like the most I know right now. That's good. I, I think that that's, um, in in a sense, that's sort of the archety archetypical uh, entrepreneurial, like healthy entrepreneurial journey, right? Like you have ideas, then you meet reality and reality takes you in different directions. And hopefully you have your ear uh, enough to the ground that you can see like where this is uh where this is coming from where this is going and then and then you can adapt right like you, you don't you don't want to love your products you want to sort of uh, uh participate in this journey in an open minded way and hopefully really find a problem that's painful that you can solve so i i think that your comment about infrastructure was sort of an understatement i think that there are is barely any uh infrastructure around operationalizing uh, LLMs right now, if you exclude the, you know, APIs themselves for the models. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, um, a lot of work that's, I, that I'm betting is going to be done there. Um, uh, would be exciting to hear more once, you know, um, I, I think this is sort of a awesome note to end on. So I'll ask the last question I ask every, uh, guest on this show, which is any recommendations you have for the audience. And it doesn't have to be related to data science and machine learning. Yeah, just, uh, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I would say think about working in public as much as you can and sharing information. You would be surprised what you think is not interesting uh, that other people find really valuable and interesting. For example, this blog post about why I decided to pivot away from MB Dev, I almost didn't publish it. I was like, no one cares. Why am I even doing this? Like, who, who cares? Um, but you know, yeah, people told me it was valuable. It was actually valuable for, I did it for myself, really. I didn't think anyone was going to read it. Um, I'm not saying like, I'm not expecting to get number one ha hacker news or anything. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is it is helpful to share these things, uh, more than you think and has, can have a big impact on your career if you consistently do it over time. I, I like that note, uh, 
this is sort of, in, in a sense, at a meta level, this is how I feel about the podcast. I started it uh, because I thought it would be fun speaking with really smart people that work on hard machine learning and MLOps related problems. I still genuinely enjoy every episode that I record. So it's really easy to continue doing it. And then some people are finding it valuable, which is a, a strong combo. So that's great. I, uh, yeah, I, I like that. Um, and I think this is an amazing note to end on. So Hamel, thank you really, really, really much. It was amazing to have you on. And um, yeah, looking forward to our next conversation. All right. Thank you. Bye, everyone. See you next time. Thank you for listening to the MLOps podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please like the video or subscribe. If you have any feedback, leave a comment below. Thanks again for listening and see you next time.